Hello, my name is Lena Newlin, and I'm a fourth generation Japanese American. I'm also a descendant of Japanese Americans that were incarcerated during World War II at Heart Mountain, just on the basis of their race. I live here in Laramie, Wyoming, and it's my honor to be invited by the University of Wyoming Art Museum to participate in this very important program. I'm going to read you an excerpt of a book that I've started writing about my family history. And just to kind of give you a little bit of context, um, I'll be reading you a fictionalized story of my great grandmother and her journey to America in the early 1900s as a picture bride. Her name was Toku Sonata and she eventually settled with her husband in Green River, Wyoming and raised her family there. So even though Toku Sonata was not incarcerated at Heart Mountain because she didn't live on the West Coast, I think that her story is still very relevant to the symposium because many of the Japanese American women that were incarcerated during World War II came to America as picture brides. And the, in other words, they sailed across the ocean to marry men that they didn't know other than through a, through a photograph. So to be completely transparent, this project of writing a book and now sharing it with you publicly today is a new endeavor for me. And I have to admit, I'm a little bit nervous, um, but I'm also very honored and also very excited to have the opportunity to tell the story of Japanese American women, uh, and particularly those in my family and the legacy that they left. So I hope you enjoy it and thank you for your interest. Picture Bride, Toku Sonata, February 1917. I have rehearsed all of the details of our first encounter. I will recognize his eyes, the ones as dark and profound as the ocean water at night, yet with slight pleats on the sides that make it look like he's smiling, even when he's not. I will recognize his jawline, the solid structure that holds his lips, that when he kisses me will taste like the inside of a ripe persimmon. I will recognize his shoulders, the fortress that when we embrace will give me refuge and then our eyes will lock, and for a brief moment, the syncopation in my chest and the fluttering in my stomach will dampen, and all will be still as we see each other, not for who we are, but for who we will become together at each other's side. The other girls on the ship have pictures too, and we gossip and giggle and brag as we construct the images of our lives convincing each other as much as ourselves of the good fortune that wait, awaits us. Who is the kind one, the wealthiest one? Who tells the best jokes? Who needs a lesson in American fashion? Who has the most land or the largest store or the nicest car? Who appreciates music and culture? Who buys us the finest silk? Who's the best in bed? Akutaro came home from work today and brought me mochi from Nagata-san's neighbor. Kiyoshi took me on a drive to see the sunset behind the mountains. Hisashi was given a promotion at work today. I think it helps us pass the time and gives us comfort. But as the sun goes down and the darkness covers us like thin wool blankets in our bunks, the salt in the air becomes a heavy shade as we settle into our mattresses and fall silent. We place our picture beneath our pillow with hopes that our dreams do come true and the slight crash of the waves against the hull lulls us to sleep. I boarded the ship in Tokyo. I was grateful for the white noise of chatter at the dock that muffled my whimpers, and for the cool mist of the morning sea air that wet my face more than my tears. The crowd was reassuring. With so many other girls also boarding the ship, we couldn't all be wrong, could we? It would be an adventure, and life would be beautiful and simple, right? At least we wouldn't be alone. Yet the knuckles on my mother's hands became frozen arthritic balls, and her hands trembled as she, looked, as she took my hands into hers to say goodbye. Make sure you keep him well fed, she said, 
and I bowed my head as a promise. My father's silence was stoic as he handed me my ticket and official papers. I again lowered my head and tried to swallow the lump in my throat that was forming. I knelt down and told my brother, the youngest, to make sure he practices his reading and writing and assured him that our sisters would continue his lessons. But at age five, he was more excited to see the large ship than he was able to comprehend that his eldest sister, his best friend, would be boarding the ship and not coming back. I'm 23 years old. It is time for me to be married, they say. I pull out the photograph again and gently caress his face. They say he comes from a good family. They say he is humble and kind. They say he has a fine job and works hard. They say he is strong and handsome. They say he needs me, wants me, will make a good husband for me. They say money is good and life is easy in America. It all sounds quite romantic. And as I lay in my bunk, I memorize his sm slight smile and gentle features from the black and white photograph that has now become tattered along the edges. The, excite the excitement and optimism from the other girls is contagious, and I find myself feeling comforted by, the, by the com their confidence and sense of adventure. Yet despite the anticipation of forecasted romance, travel across the ocean, and new land, I feel a pang in my stomach like a heavy ball of rice. Because this trip across the sea with strangers to meet someone who I have married through Omii is not exactly my choice. It is February 1917. It has been two weeks since we said goodbye to our families. I am ready to arrive in America, see the new landscapes, and start my new life. I am also ready to stand on solid ground, to have my own house, my own kitchen, my own space, because that is what you do in America. The girls with whom I shared this space are pleasant. We talk about starting our new lives together, living next door to each other, working in our husband's stores and companies together, raising our children together. Our excitement rises at the, as the captain announces that land is near. It is time to dress for our most important moment. The hinges on my suitcase squeak as I open the lid, and I can't help but close my eyes as the delicious smell of home arises from the contents. I was elated when we purchased the suitcase new for my trip, but my excitement was muted when I placed my kasuri kimono into it and I saw that it left little space for anything else. Don't worry, my mother had said, for my husband will buy me everything I need in America. I take out the soft fabric and embrace it. My new friend Chioko and I help each other dress. She's younger than me by a few years, and I have learned that, like me, she is here because her family's financial situation is difficult. Like me, she comes from a small fishing village where she worked every day to support her family. Like me, her family spent most of their savings on her travel and her kimono, and they are counting on her to work and send back money. This is a situation for many of us, Yet the anticipation of soon arriving in America is a welcomed distraction for now, and all of us girls are busy helping each other look our best. And, we're, and when we are finished, we crowd together on the deck, rocking in partnership with the boat, an awkward dance as we approach America and each try to get, catch first glimpse of our new land. I am not sure what I expected my arrival in America to be. I had not actually imagined those details. But as the ship pulls up to the dock, the gray skies and cold, wet air greet me like an unwelcome guest. I feel Chioko's hand grip tightly around my elbow, and her dark eyes are like a mirror of my own emotions. The excitement and anticipation that have floated us across the ocean has been dampened by the gray Seattle fog, and I feel a sense of longing to return to Japan and to everything familiar. But a horn sounds, and all of us shuffle together off the ship, a sea of young Japanese women dressed in our best kimonos, black hair styled as best as we can manage on a choppy ocean. Chioko and I stay attached at our elbows and our suitcases flop against our legs as we move with the crowd of women into a room where they say we will be processed. The immigration officials ask many questions. There's a translator that helps as best as he can, but some of the questions I'm not sure if I cannot understand the translator 
or if they use words that just completely are unfamiliar. How much money do you have? Do you have relatives in the United States? Are you an anarchist? Are you a polygamist? Do you have a job? I lower my head and hand over my paperwork, and I show them the photo of my husband. I watch the official write something in his book, and then he gestures for me to continue through metal gates in the line to the next room for the medical examination. The stethoscope is cold, and I shiver as it touches my bare skin. The nurse keeps her eyes on her papers and asks many questions. Have I been sick or crippled? Have I stayed in a hospital or institution that focuses on the care or treatment of the insane? I shake my head no to everything and feel relieved when I am sent out of this room. It never occurred to most of us how we would find our new spouses, where we would meet them, what we would say to them. But at last, we are released from immigration officials, and we make our way through more gates to a large open room full of Japanese men. My feeling of relief from being liberated finally from immigration quickly transforms into a sense of terror. I feel my stomach ball up and I force myself to breathe. I follow the lead of the other girls and hold up the photo of my husband. Is it you? I ask a man and he shakes his head no. Do you know him? I ask another and another and another and they all give me the same negative response. At the same time that I am searching for my husband, I am also watching the other girls, my friends, as they unite with their spouses. I can see the confusion in the faces of the girls who had bragged about their handsome husbands. The men in this room had gray hair and calloused hands and tattered clothes and dirty shoes. Where were these husbands that were landowners and business execu executives? Where were these husbands that had boyish smiles and fancy cars? Where were these husbands from the photos? Had there been some mistake? Chiyoko and I had become separated in the immigration shuffling, and I suddenly feel a greater urge to find her than to find my husband. I see her across the room. She's standing in the shadow of a man who has taken her suitcase. I wave and try to get her attention, but her head is lowered and her gaze is down. The man is wearing a dark suit with sleeves that hang beyond his knuckles. He wears a hat, but tufts of gray and black stick out. I run to Chiyoko, and she nearly collapses into my arms. She says nothing, but her eyes plead with me not to leave her. The man helps her stand and puts his arm around her. He looks at me with sad eyes that say, I'm sorry I sent the wrong picture. I'm sorry I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm sorry I lied about my money. He hands me a piece of paper with an address and says that he will take good care of her. I do my best to hold back tears and watch as she follows him outside into the drizzle. I yearn to run after Chiyoko, the only person familiar to me in this cold, cold, gray world now, but I am held back by the sensation of a heavy hand on my shoulder. I turn around, and there he is, my husband. Instinctively, my eyes drop, and I accept that this is my new life.